Benvenuti a tutti a questo terzo annual Lonergan Lecture e do la mano subito al padre decano del, di teologia, padre Darius Kowalczyk, per aprire questo evento. Dear friends, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this third annual Lonergan Lecture and above all, to welcome Professor Neil Ormerot of the Australian Catholic University, who will give the talk this evening. Professor Ormerot is a family man, and he and his wife, Thea, have six grandchildren. He is also considered to be one of the most erudite and creative scholars of Lonergan's thought living today. He has written on a wide variety of topics in systemat systematic theology, but he has always maintained a lively interest in a theology of the Trinity, about which he will speak tonight. I must say that I will listen with eagerness to what he has to say as this is the theme that I also teach here in the Gregorian. Professor Ormerot, I look forward to learning much from you tonight. I would like to say a word about our project of supporting Lonergan studies here in the Faculty of Theology at the Gregorian. Seven years ago, this idea was initiated by Father Francois Xavier de Mortier, then the rector of the university. He identified Father Jerry Willan of our Department of Fundamental Theology as someone who had studied the thought of Lonergan for his doctorate and who would be capable of playing a role in promoting what might become what he called a little school of Lonergan within the university. Seven years on, this little school clearly exists. And for this, I thank Father Willan for his dedication to and enthusiasm for this project. In addition to this annual Lonergan lecture, we have a so-called Lonergan club which is an informal seminar devoted to reading Lonergan's works and meets in a convivial atmosphere about once a month. Similarly, we offer opportunities for doctoral students to consider using a Lonergan method as a base for whatever topic they are studying. In fact, Professor Ormerot spent two hours with such students this morning. Very nice meeting. For this last years, our little school of Lonergan has enjoyed the support of our current rector, Father Nuno Gonsalves. Father Nuno would have wished to be here tonight, but unfortunately is involved with the meeting of the University Senate. Finally, I would like to return to welcoming Professor Ormerot. Once again, we thank you for being with us and helping us to launch our year-long set of Lonergan activities. May the Triune God, who acts generously in creation, bless you, your family, and the important work that you do. mostrare che non, non siamo così, soltanto coloro con capelli grigi nel Lonergan Club, quindi invito eh, Adam per ripetere in un certo senso brevemente ciò che ha detto eh, eh, il decano nel suo riguardo. Grazie. Uh, sono un scolastico gesuita nel primo ciclo della teologia quella gregoriana e volevo invitarvi tutti a venire al club. Um, si tratta di un'ora ogni mese più o meno, 
e abbiamo scelto quest'anno di concentrarci su un unico testo, cioè il metodo in teologia. Uh, dunque, chi non conosce Lonegan può avere un'introduzione ottima al suo pensiero e chi già lo conosce può approfondire la conoscenza, è un testo ricco. Uh, non si tratta delle lezioni, non si tratta delle conferenze, ma piuttosto delle conversazioni, dei scambi fra i partecipanti. Um, conversazione um, accademica, accademiche, ma direi anche fra amici. Uh, finalmente, um, a mio avviso, non è per creare l'organisti, cioè devoti. Um, non è l'unica voce nella teologia, ma a mio avviso è per trovare un aiuto uh, allo studio della teologia e la filosofia. Dunque, siete tutti invitati. Ci sarà un foglio per iscrivervi su quella tavola. Grazie. Molto grazie. E forse avete questi, questo elenco delle date e delle temi di ogni incontro quest'anno. So, your, the introductions are not yet finished. I know you want to uh, listen to Professor Ormerod, but I'd like to say a few words of a more technical introduction to him. Although, in fact, I'd like to start on a personal note. I first became aware of the name of Neil Ormerod during doctoral studies in Toronto in the early 1990s when I heard that he was considered a premier interpreter, not only of the thought of Bernard Lonergan, but also of Robert Doran, another important student of Lonergan, who was my doctoral director. I had the opportunity to meet Neil at a conference 10 years ago, and we became friends. We now enjoy the wonders of Skype and have uh, meetings, uh, conversations from time to time between Rome and Sydney. Here I sometimes speak also with Neil's wife. We hear news of their children and grandchildren. And uh, Neil's wife, Thea, is also an activist for the ecology movement in Australia, so we talk about those matters. Neil has told me his remarkable story of discovering Lonergan. He had just finished a doctorate in mathematics and was beginning a career in that line when he read Insight, decided to abandon his career as a mathematician with the support of his wife, planning to build a, a family, and start from scratch in the study of theology. This was a radical choice and a risky one, and it is a testimony to two things. Neil's deep Christian faith and his conviction about how much the thought of Bernard Lonergan has to offer the church and the world. Since then, Neil has established a career at the Australian Catholic University, where he is a member of the Institute for Religion and Critical Inquiry. He has entered the ranks of the most well-known and respected Catholic theologians in the English-speaking world. A simple count of the number of articles he has published in a journal like Theological Studies is a testament to this. But now let me add, a certain more technical list of, of, of accomplishments. Professor Ormerod has published 14 books, 80 articles, 30 book chapters, and 10 edited volumes. In addition to the journal already mentioned, he has published in our own journal, the Gregorianum, Irish Theological Quarterly, Heathrop Journal, and Louvain Studies. The, topic to which, the topics to which he returns regularly include Trinitarian theology, upon which he speaks tonight, natural theology, Christian anthropology, and historical ecclesiology. In 2013, he was made a fellow of the Australian Catholic Theological Association, the first lay theologian ever to be so honored. His most recent book is Faith and Reason, on the possibility of a Christian philosophy, which engages the work of Etienne Gilson with Bernard Lonergan on issues around faith and reason. He is currently working on a book on Trinitarian systematic theology as part of a work of collaboration with Robert Doran. Finally, returning to the personal note, Neil functions informally as a mentor of young theologians all around the world. 
when you talk about one country or another, he'll know somebody there and they will have been turning to him, as indeed I have turned to him in, in recent years, as a, a wisdom figure, an advisor. So his commitment is often hidden in uh, just how much he is helping the project of theology and a Lonergan method in doing so. So Neil, thank you for being with us, coming all the way from Sydney, and we, with eagerness, wait to hear you. Well, thank you very much for that uh, warm introduction, Jerry. Um, it's, uh, I'd also like to thank, too, the, uh, the rector, Father Nuno Gonzalez, and the dean of the Faculty of Theology, Father Darius Kowalczyk, for their generous and important institutional support for this venture. Uh, special thanks to Jerry. Uh, we have known one another, I think, now for about 20 years. Uh, first by email, and uh, more recently, as Jerry mentioned, we've been able to meet one another in the flesh, which has been a real pleasure. Uh, it's an honour, too, to be here at the uh, Gregorian University, where Lonergan himself spent so many years teaching and uh, developing the ideas, uh, some of which we'll be talking about tonight. Uh, this morning we had a seminar looking at the Lonergan theological method which he developed in uh, graduate seminars at this institution. Uh, but this evening I want to look at some of his specifically Trinitarian work, uh, again courses that he taught here at the Greg, and um, have recently been made available uh, in the collected works of Bernard Lonergan in English translation. Uh, this is a great boon for those of us for whom languages are a difficult thing to, to uh, deal with. Uh, now let me move on and we'll begin the lecture, How a Trinitarian God Acts in Creation, Augustine, Aquinas and Lonergan. Now, the Trinity is a central mystery of our Christian faith. The New Testament is suffused with the Trinitarian imagination, which carries through into the early liturgies and prayers of the emerging church, culminating in the Trinitarian controversies and their resolution in the creeds of Nicaea and Constantinople. The Nicaean-Constantinople creed has been a touchstone of Trinitarian orthodoxy in both East and West ever since, despite our dispute over the filioque. Given the centrality of this belief, the, the theological issue in the spirit of faith-seeking understanding is how are we to understand what we hold to be true in faith? Commonly, this theological question of understanding focuses attention on the three persons in one God. How can God be one, one nature, and three, three persons? This is obviously an important and indeed central question. Unless some response, however analogous to this question, can be given, Christians are left without an answer to even the simplest questions about what they believe then their belief becomes mere words without understanding. However, there is another not unrelated issue hidden in the creed. How can this God, who is three in one, act in human history? Already in the creed we read that for us and for our salvation, he, the Son, came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate in the Virgin Mary. And that the Spirit has spoken through the prophets. These assertions seem to indicate specific engagements of the Son and the Spirit in the economy of salvation. Put simply, it is the Son who is incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth, not the Father or the Spirit. How can this be so? This question is made more complicated because of a theological axiom 
to the effect that all works at extra, that is, not internal to the Trinity itself, are the work of the one God, Father, Son and Spirit, without distinction. <coughs> this axiom, which goes back to Augustine, was reaffirmed by Pope Pius XII in Mystici Corporis Christi. Let all hold this as certain truth, that all these activities at extra are common to the Most Blessed Trinity, insofar as they have God as supreme efficient cause. Read blindly, this axiom would threaten to rob us of what we explicitly affirm. How can we know of the Blessed Trinity unless there is some distinctive activity or presence of the divine persons in the created order? And so we are left with a theological problem. On the one hand, we want to affirm the distinctive activities of at least the Son and the Spirit within the created order. On the other hand, there are strict limits about how we might conceive of such activities as occurring. What I propose to consider here is what can be called a genetic sequence of theological attempts to address this problem. The first attempt is none other than, none other than Augustine himself in his profound work De Trinitate. Augustine grasps the issue but finds no clear resolution. We then move to Aquinas who provides a theologically solid response through his linkage of the two divine missions with the two, uh, two divine processions and the two missions. We then consider the contribution of Bernard Lonegan who generalises the construct used by Aquinas to a consideration of the four Trinitarian relations and four created participations in the divine nature, what has come to be called the four-point hypothesis. I shall conclude with some observations about how this approach might impact on our understanding of Jesus as the one in whom the fullness of divinity dwells. So we turn to Augustine. In Book 5 of De Trinitate, Augustine shifts from his biblical arguments in Book 1 to 4 to move into a more theoretical mode based on the category of relation. This allows him to distinguish between things said substance-wise in relationship to God and things said relation-wise by which the persons of the Trinity may be differentiated. He can then address arguments raised by Arian objections to the Trinity in an effective philosophical manner. In his discussion, Augustine expounds what will become a classical Trinitarian formulation concerning what can be said or affirmed about the Father, Son and Spirit. Whatever is said in relationship, in relation to them substance-wise, is said of all three equally. And I quote, So then the Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, and the Spirit is almighty. Yet there are not three almighties, but only one almighty. This type of formulation is fully exploited in what we call the Athanasian Creed. The only distinctions then that can arise in terms is in terms of their relations. To quote, but for the things, but as for the things each of the three in this triad is called, they are proper or peculiar to himself. Such things are never said with reference to the self, but only with reference to each other or to creation. And therefore it is clear that they are said by way of relationship and not by way of substance. The phrase, not only with reference to each other or to creation, 
is, I would claim, pregnant with possibilities. The translator of the text, Edmund Hill, is aware that something is happening here, but is quick to dismiss it as confusion. Augustine is indeed feeling his way here, as Hill suggests. But perhaps in regard to a more profound question of how to relate the Trinity to the created order in, in case of incarnation or grace. Can the logic of relations be exploited to provide a framework for understanding such an extension of divine activity to individual persons of the Trinity? While Augustine does not directly make the connection, he does begin to assemble the component parts. He begins with an analysis of the relationship between the Spirit and the Father and the Son, again to quote. We say that the Holy Spirit, we say this Holy Spirit of the Father, but we do not reverse it and say the Father of the Holy Spirit, or we should take the Holy Spirit to be his Son. Again, we say the Holy Spirit of the Son, but we do not say the Son of the Holy Spirit or we should take the Holy Spirit to be his Father. The only solution to this situation is to posit a relationship of Father and Son to the Holy Spirit, what has become known as the Philagoque, as a single origin. Well, we must confess then we must confess that the Father and the Son are the origin of the Holy Spirit, not two origins, but, but, just, uh, but just as the Father and the Son are one God, and with reference to the creation, one creator and one Lord, so with reference to the Holy Spirit, they are one origin, but with reference to the creation, Father, Son and Holy Spirit are one origin just as they are one creator and one Lord. What is significant here is the analogy that Augustine draws between the relationship of the Father, Son and Spirit as one God to creation and the relationship between Father and Son to the Spirit. Both are relations of origin, though one is ad extra and the other is ab intra. Augustine then pushes the matter further by examining the notion of the spirit as gift. Is gift a relational name or is it a name which emerges only in the created order when the spirit is actually given to us? And again, to quote Augustine, how could he already be the divine substance if he only is by being given? Or is the answer that the Holy Spirit always proceeds and proceeds from eternity, not from a point in time? But because he so proceeds as to be giveable, he was already gift even before there was anyone to give him to. To be given from a point in time implies a created reality. Certainly Augustine wants the Son to proceed eternally, or the Spirit to proceed eternally, but leaves open the possibility of the Spirit being given at some point in time as a donation, introducing a distinction between being a gift and being actually donated. To quote Augustine, the Spirit, to make myself clear, is everlasting gift but donation only from a point of time. In other words, a contingent reality in a point of time is being predicated of the spirit as a donation, which arises from his personal identity as gift, but which is distinct from it precisely because it is contingent or created. Now, Augustine immediately enters into a discussion of the more general question of the relation between God and creation and how contingent realities can be predicated of God. Again, to quote, 
Look, this is the problem. He cannot be everlasting Lord, or would we, we would be compelled to say that creation is everlasting, because he would only be everlasting Lord if creation were everlastingly serving him. The discussion which follows is a classical exposition of the issue of contingent predication. Thus, when he is called something with reference to creation, while indeed he begins to be called it in time, we should understand that this does not involve anything happening to God's own substance, but only to the created thing to which the relationship predicated of him refers. So it is clear that anything that can be said about God in time, which was not said about him before, is said by way of relationship, and not yet by way of modification of God, as though something had modified him. So he's setting up this issue of a relationship as the way in which God relates to the created order. Now, book five here ends rather abruptly uh, and somewhat incomplete, in my opinion. Augustine has introduced the distinction between the spirit as gift and the spirit as donation. He has explored the notion of contingent predication to conclude that any contingent predication of God to the created order is said by way of relationship. All that is needed is to bring the spirit relationship to the father and the son into the ambit of contingent predication to say that this relation is something, uh, this relation of donation, is something like the way in which we can speak of the spirit as donation through a form of contingent predication based not just on the creator-creature relation but in some sense analogous to the relation of the father and the son to the spirit. Now this is a step he does not take. And so we move to Thomas Aquinas. The one who does take this step is Thomas Aquinas in his account of the Trinitarian missions. In eight articles, Aquinas explores what can be truly said about the various persons in relations to the, tri to the divine missions of Son and Spirit. He begins by spelling out the ways in which the divine person can be sent. This mission involves a double aspect. Thus, the mission of a divine person is a fitting thing, as meaning in one way the procession of origin from the sender, and as meaning a new way of existing in another. And thus, the Son is said to be sent by the Father into the world, inasmuch as he began to exist visibly in the world by taking on our nature. This new way of existing in another is a contingent reality precisely because it is in a creature. But this new way of being is related in some sense to the procession of origin from the sender. Mission and procession are related through a contingent reality. This is spelt out more clearly in Article 2 when he asks whether the mission is eternal or only temporal. Here Aquinas comes to an important conclusion. Mission signifies not only procession from a principle, but also determines the temporal term of the procession. Hence the mission is only temporal or we may say that it includes the eternal procession with the addition of a temporal effect. For the relation of a divine person to his principle must be eternal. Hence, a procession may be called a twin procession, eternal and temporal, 
Not that there is a double relation to the principle, but a double term of the procession, one temporal and one eternal. And so mission comprises the procession with the addition of a temporal effect or created term. This created term places the recipient in the same relation to its origin as does the term of the procession in relation to its origin, hence a double term. Through this created term, the divine person is genuinely sent into the created order. Now Aquinas immediately goes on to specify this process in terms of sanctifying grace and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Again, we are said to possess only what we can freely use or enjoy. To have the power of enjoying the divine person can only be according to sanctifying grace. And yet the Holy Spirit is possessed by man and dwells within him in the very gift itself of sanctifying grace. Hence the Holy Ghost himself is given and sent. Now though it is not explicit in this text, the Spirit proceeds by active spiration. He is breathed forth by the Father and the Son. So for the Spirit to be given and sent, there needs to be a created term in the grace person, which in some sense imitates the uncreated term of active spiration, that is the Holy Spirit. This extends the way in which creatures imitate God as the exemplary cause of all creation through their own natural act of being into the supernatural order whereby the temporal term in the supernaturally elevated subject imitates the term of the intradivine relation of active spiration. Just as God is not changed in the, rela in the relation of creature to, uh, created creature, neither is the spirit changed through the creation of this new relation. But the creature is radically changed through the presence of the spirit existing in a new way within us. Now in doing this, Aquinas takes a step that Augustine did not take. The pieces were all in De Trinitate, but they were not combined. It took a more ordered presentation driven by a stronger systematic exigence to arrive at the place where Aquinas could stand. Of course, the account does not end here and there are other aspects to deal with. We've already seen reference above to the sending of the Son. This is not dealt with in as much detail until much later in the Summa, in the third part. So in the third part of the Summa, Aquinas spends a number of questions considering the nature of the incarnation and its necessity. In the second question, seventh article of the third part, he asks, whether the union of the divine nature and the human nature is anything created. In responding, we find Aquinas immediately referring to the structure of contingent predication. Now, as was said above, every relation which we consider between God and the creature is really in the creature, by whose change the relation is brought into being. Whereas it is not really in God, but only in our way of thinking, since it does not arise from any change in God. And hence we must say that the union of which we are speaking is not really in God, except only in our way of thinking, but in the human nature, which is a creature. It is really. Therefore, we must say it is something created. <coughs> This, is, this relation is further specified in terms of the divine hypostasis, again to quote Aquinas, a man, that is Jesus of Nazareth, is called creator 
and is God because of the union, inasmuch as it, the man, is terminated in a divine hypostasis. Thus there is a created contingent reality in the human nature which enables us to say that this human being truly is the second person of the Trinity. And this created reality is relational, supernatural, and in some sense imitative of the relation whereby the Father generates the Son. That is, the relation that has terminated in the divine hypostasis of the Son. That relation technically is paternity, not filiation, because the relation of paternity terminates in the Son. Now this same theme is taken up later in the Summa, uh, where here Aquinas asks whether there is only one being in Christ. Here Aquinas comes to basically the same conclusion. And thus, since the human nature is united to the Son of God hypostatically or personally, as was said above, and not accidentally, it follows that by the human nature there accrued to him no new personal being, but only a new relation of the pre-existing personal being, the Logos, to the human nature, in such a way that the person is said to subsist not merely in the divine, but also in the human nature. What occurs in the incarnation is the creation of a new relation of a pre-existing personal being to human nature, which occurs in such a way that the person is said to subsist not merely in the divine, but also in the, in the human nature. If we pushed, we could further refer to the term of this relation as the secondary act of existence, which constitutes Jesus as existing as the Son of God. Now, just to put this in diagrammatic form, what we have here is a sort of diagrammatic summary. We have the two processions, the Son from the Father and the Spirit from the Father and the Son. Each of these processions constitutes a mission through a created term. In the case of Jesus, it is his secondary act of existence. In the case of the Spirit, it is sanctifying grace. These created realities imitate the term of the relation so that we can truly say Jesus is the Son of God and we can truly say the Spirit dwells within us. Now, before concluding this examination of the use of contingent relation in relation to the missions of the Spirit as grace and the Son in the Incarnation, it's worth noting an instance where Aquinas does not use the same framework, but potentially could have done so. This is an important example because it has implications for contemporary theologians. It concerns Aquinas' handling of the metaphysics of the beatific vision, which is a difficult and controverted topic. The solution arrived at posits the existence, uh, posits the divine essence as in some sense acting as a form in relation to our intellect. But when any created intellect sees the essence of God, the essence of God itself becomes the intelligible form of the intellect. Hence it is necessary that some supernatural disposition should be added to the intellect in order that it be raised up to such a great and sublime height. In the theological lexicon of Karl Rana, this analysis gives rise to the notion of quasi-formal causality. The divine essence acts as if, quasi, it is united to the intellect so that we see the divine essence in itself. Arana then uses this construct as a template for his discussions of grace and incarnation. 
As the article goes on to note, the supernatural disposition is a created light, the light of glory, which is necessary to see the essence of God, not in order to make the essence of God intelligible, which is, is all itself intelligible, but in order to enable the intellect to understand in the same way as a habit makes a power able to act. Now what is missing here, I contend, is the same logic that Aquinas has used in relationship to sanctifying grace and incarnation. In both those cases, there is a contingent reality predicated to divinity as Son and Spirit, which is a relational reality that in some sense imitates the processions of the Son and Spirit. Now regarding the beatific vision, we again have a created reality in the intellect of the blessed, the light of glory. As a created reality in us, it can only be a relational reality in God. For again, to quote Augustine, anything that can be said about God in time, which is not said about him before, is said by way of relationship. Now, either this relationship is to the divine essence alone, in which case we, simp we have simply the, creator, the creature creator relationship, which does not attain God as Trinitarian, or it is an entry into the relational reality of the persons of the Trinity in some, as yet un way, to be, in, in some way as yet to be specified. This would allow a proper Trinitarian account of the beatific vision. And this is the direction taken by Lonergan. And so we move to Lonergan and the four-point hypothesis. The question we can pose is, what if Rana had moved in the opposite direction? Moving not from beatific vision to the missions, but from the missions to the beatific vision. What would this look like? Could we then have a Trinitarian account of the beatific vision? Now the traditional scholastic account of the beatific vision seeks to address the question of how we can understand the biblical witness that we shall see God face to face, taken to mean without the mediation of any creature, and so know as fully as we are known. 1 Corinthians 13. How then can our finite consciousness apprehend God? The scholastic response is that the human nature cannot do this unaided and so requires the light of glory, a supernatural elevation of our humanity, which empowers us to truly participate in the divine essence. Now this light of glory is a created reality something in us, at the same time strictly supernatural. Can we relate it to a divine person? We might, for example, think of the light of glory then as a further instance of the missions of the Son or the Spirit, for example. Rana here thinks of the beatific vision as the completion of the life of grace, and that's one way of thinking of it. But is there an alternative? For example, may we bring the Father into our account of the beatific vision? To achieve this, we need something more. This something more could be to generalise the structure Aquinas has given us. What makes Aquinas's structure work <coughs> is the conjunction of the procession with a created term of the procession to constitute a mission. However, each procession specifies two distinct relations. If we take the procession of the Son from the Father, we have two relations, the Father to the Son and the Son to the Father. What if we generalise Aquinas' structure by considering not processions, but relations conjoined with the created term. Then we might consider the light of glory 
not in terms of the processions, but as an instance of a relation that terminates in the Father. The light of glory could be thought of as a created participation in the relation of the Son to the Father. This is not a mission because the Son does not send the Father, but it is the presence of the Father through this form of participation in a Trinitarian relation. Put that in diagrammatic form. So whereas previously we had the relation of father to son leading to the incarnation, here the suggestion is that if we take the reverse relation of son to father with a created effect, then we have the light of glory. Now, scholastic theology is very familiar with the notion of the four Trinitarian relations that arise from the processions. Traditionally, these have been called paternity, father to son, filiation, son to father, active spiration, father and son to spirit, and passive spiration, spirit to son and father. This means we have now four possible ways of participating in the Trinitarian relations. Two of which we already know through the divine processions as incarnation and grace. The other two add something new. And so we're now in a position, position to spell out uh, the final hypothesis, indeed what we call the four point, four point hypothesis, wherein Lonegan states his conclusion linking the four relations to four created participations of the divine nature. So first there are four real relations, really identical with the divine substance, and therefore there are four very special modes that ground the external imitation of the divine substance. Next there are four absolutely supernatural realities which never found uninformed namely the secondary active existence of the incarnation, sanctifying grace, the habit of charity and the light of glory. It would not be inappropriate, so this is, this is the hypothetical element here, it would not be inappropriate therefore to say that the secondary active existence of the incarnation is the created participation of paternity. Why? Because paternity terminates in the sun so the imitation of that is uh, the incarnation. And so has a special relationship to the Son. That sanctifying grace is, an act, is a participation in the active spiration. Uh, and so has a special relation to the Holy Spirit. That the habit of charity is a participation, a passive spiration. And so has a special relation to the Father and the Son and that the light of glory is a special participation of sonship and so in its most perfect way brings the children of adoption back to the Father. Now what this adds to the classical construct of processions and missions found in Aquinas is the two additional relations, affiliation and passive spiration to give two further created participations in the divine nature the light of glory and the habit of charity. Again, to put up a diagram for that. Now, I'm not suggesting that Lonigan followed this type of argument I've spelled out here. In fact, we know very little of the origins of this in Lonigan's thoughts. Though there is a shift in his earlier language of created communications of the divine nature to that of created participations in the divine nature, which I think helped facilitate his expansion of the schema of Aquinas. We have earlier, an earlier, not strictly identical version in a prior work on grace, uh, and some tinkering of this same model in his works on Christology. And he never developed it past this present reference 
since in his personal life, in his career, he moved on from these strictly theological concerns to more methodological ones, resulting in his book Method and Theology, and then into questions of economics, which may surprise you. This is an interesting case of what if. If you want to explore, I, say, I now want to explore just one aspect of this that links the four-point hypothesis with Christology. So what does this look like if we start applying it to Jesus? Now there are many different uh, directions in which we can take this construct that are theologically fruitful. I would note in particular Robert Doran's linkage of these four created participations of grace and the three uh, uh, and the three th theological virtues of faith, hope and charity. This is important because it enables us to understand these virtues as central to our Trinitarian life as Christians. However, I'd like to move in a more Christological direction. We begin with an observation, perhaps not uncontroversial, that each of the four created participations in the divine life that Lodingen speaks of occur in the person of Jesus Christ. Let me spell this out. Why is that stuck? Don't you love technology? Something had popped up. Right. First, there is relation of paternity, which terminates in the son. The created term of this relation allows us to say that Jesus, truly say that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. That this is his personal identity or who he is. This is the basic mystery of the Incarnation affirmed at the Council of Chalcedon about the personal identity of Jesus. Second, second there is a relation of filiation which terminates in the Father. This would mean that Jesus enjoys the light of glory. Now, according to a long tradition with some degree of magisterial authority, Jesus enjoyed the beatific vision during his earthly sojourn. Lonergan's work posits an intrinsic connection here between his identity as son and this enjoyment of the beatific vision. It also means that Jesus has a unique relevatory role that arises from this. While there has been some significant theological discussion and disagreement about whether Jesus actually did enjoy the beatific vision, certainly Lonergan held it as real while dispelling uh, misconceptions about what this vision might consist in. These two elements of Jesus' personal identity as a second person of the Trinity and his enjoyment of the beatific vision occupied a good deal of what might be called classical Christology in the scholastic mode. However, what the four-point hypothesis reveals that this is only half a Christology, since it omits a specifically pneumatological aspect from consideration. Now, according to Aquinas, Jesus also enjoys and requires sanctifying grace, which is the presence of the Spirit. Now, our present stance now allows us to more fully develop, uh, to, uh, to allows us, sorry, allows for a more fully developed spirit Christology. And so, there is, thirdly, there is the relation of active spiration which terminates in the spirit. 
through this relation, Jesus enjoys the love of God in the same way that we do, as God's love poured into his heart by the Holy Spirit who has given him. On him the Spirit rests and is given without reserve. Through this gift of Spirit, Jesus truly is the anointed one of God, the Christ, whom the Father calls his beloved, in whom he delights. In more pious parlance, this allows us to speak of the Spirit as the heart of Jesus, his sacred heart. It is from this core of being loved unrestrictedly by the Father that all Jesus' human actions flow. Finally, there is then passive spiration, which terminates in the Father and the Son. Here we can identify this with Jesus' doing the work of the Father, a strong theme in John's Gospel, but which appears in the synoptic tradition, I would argue, as the working, of, working for the kingdom of God. Jesus responds to being loved by the Father with his own human love of God, with all his heart, mind and strength, and of his neighbour as himself. Indeed, the whole of the Gospels speak of this work of Jesus, his mission from the Father to proclaim God's kingdom, culminating in his death and resurrection. There have been a chorus of theological voices noting the lack of a proper account of the spirit in the life of Jesus, with calls for a spirit Christology made loud and clear. Some who have responded to these calls have felt our calls have done so by significantly modifying their Trinitarian theologies or even dismissing the Trinity itself. An approach to Christology through Lonergan's four-point hypothesis allows us to respond to those calls in a manner which is entirely consonant both with doctrinal and systematic traditions by generalising a construct based on two processions and missions to one involving four Trinitarian relations and four created participations of the divine nature. This involves then an extension of the tradition rather than its modification. Now let me move to a conclusion. I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear. Now let me conclude with some comments about the person whose work we commemorate this evening. Bernard Lonergan is perhaps best known for his two major works, his philosophical work Insight and his methodological work Method in Theology. Yet for a considerable part of his career, Lonergan worked here at the Gregorian University teaching courses in Trinity and Christology, labouring under what he called impossible conditions. I'm not sure whether the professors here currently find conditions impossible or not. You'll have to ask them. In the course of this work, he developed some profound theological tones, which have now been made available in English translation through the publication of his collected works. What we have considered here, considered this evening, is one of his most original contributions, going beyond his master Aquinas to make his own mark in the discipline of systematic theology. It is a development rich in possibilities, as both Robert Doran and I have attempted to demonstrate in various publications. However, these were developments that Lonegan himself never investigated. Increasingly, his thought turned to methodological issues, resulting in the publication of Method in Theology. He looked back at the theological style of his theological manuals as a relic from the past, not congruent with the direction he thought theology, theology should take into the future. With the publication of Method and spurred on by the challenge of liberation theology, his intellectual energy turned to questions of economics, 
taking up again work he had undertaken in his spare time in the 1940s. Apart from a few cursory comments in various essays, Lonigan did not return to these profound and difficult questions in Trinity and Christology. And while we may regret this decision, it has left the field open for others to unpack some of the remarkable riches in his work in systematic theology. And I hope that this evening has given you just a taste of what some of these riches might be. Abbiamo adesso quasi un'ora per scambiare. Eh, vorrei cominciare con qualche commento, poi abbiamo organizzato due eh, 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 risposte, eh, che du due persone verranno qui e poi un po' di, di, di scambio, però lascerà molto tempo per, tempo per noi, quindi eh, spero che possiamo masticare quasi eh, eh, il carne denso che abbiamo ricevuto eh, adesso. Eh, e per quella, rag quella ragione, infatti, provo a parlare nel mio povero italiano eh, per aiutarci forse a ricevere ciò che abbiamo sentito. Anzi, provo a fare una, la mia povera rassegna di alcuni punti chiavi in questo discorso. Eh, allora, per prima, Agostino, eh, la questione di sostanza di Dio che agisce, eh, Dio creatore, Dio redentore agisce nella sua sostanza. Quindi per evitare il problema di treteismo dovremmo dire che c'è soltanto una singola sostanza in Dio. Quindi dovremmo parlare di più di, delle tre persone che ag agiscono insieme per le cose importanti. Eh, quindi è Agostino che ha cominciato a parlare, dal, di dire che quando parliamo di Dio parliamo sempre del uno, delle tre persone insieme. La sola, il solo momento quando parliamo delle tre persone e quando dobbiamo distinguere i rapporti fra le tre, che il figlio non è il, il padre, eh, il padre non è il figlio, lo Spirito Santo non è tutti e due altri. Quindi relazioni e sostanza, quella, quella questione. Perché veramente Agostino vedeva che c'era la tentazione un po' ignorante alla luce di una lealtà al concilio di Necea, di parlare come tre te teisti, ci sono tre dei, quindi è tanto difficile ovviamente, come parlare della singola sostanza di Dio che agisce in creazione, ma alla stessa volta riconoscere che ci sono tre persone in Dio stesso, prima infatti di parlare della creazione, cioè c'è la, tri la, la trinità imminente in Dio, ma non siamo tra, tre teisti, Agostino. Quindi la nozione in, in Tommaso d'Aquino, sempre più sistematico di Agostino, è, è, di una, è la, una predicazione contingente. Se possiamo capire quella nozione abbiamo la metà di questo discorso, penso. Quindi c'è... C'è la natura, ma non stiamo parlando tanto de della creazione della natura, ma delle conseguenze dell'incarnazione di Gesù Cristo e il dono dello Spirito Santo, la grazia santificante in noi. Cioè l'aspetto soprannaturale. Ricordiamo che Agostino non aveva quel, quella distinzione, parlare di naturale, soprannaturale. È una, uno sviluppo intellettuale soltanto nella generazione prima di, di Tommaso d'Aquino. Quindi la teologia adesso è la scienza delle cose soprannaturali. Quindi lui ha parlato di, di, di questa stranezza, eh, che noi siamo crea 
creati, creatori, eh, ma abbiamo un aspetto soprannaturale. Viviamo un, una vita naturale con un, un aiuto soprannaturale in conseguenza dell'incarnazione di Gesù. Come riflettere su, eh, su quello? Lui una, ha detto che per prima, la prima, il primo momento di grazia santificante è una partecipazione in che cosa? Nella sostanza di Dio. Una partecipazione però, non, non diveniamo mai Dio noi stessi, quindi è una partecipazione creata di qualcosa soprannaturale. Quindi la nozione di, di, di predicazione contingente è, è, è creata, in, in, altri modi, in altre parole. Allora, poi, come indagare di più la nostra vita di grazia? E, e questo è così che Tommaso comincia a dire qualcosa, ma Lonergan affara qualcosa di più. Avete notato la Forte contra il forte contrasto con Karl Rahner, che spaglia in questa, questa maniera. Rahner non capisce di, di indagare la vita di grazia in, un, in una maniera di una partecipazione nostra, non soltanto nella sostanza eh, di, di Dio, una, è una partecipazione sempre creata, ma anche nelle quattro rapporti, quattro relazioni di, de, della Trinità. Quindi questa è, un, è un, una, una apertura enorme per la teologia sistematica oggi. C'è tanto chiacchierata nel, nei giornali di teologia di questo four point hypothesis. C'è una ricchezza. Quindi la grazia è, 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 quindi sto parlando di Robert Doran, meno della cristologia di Ormerod eh, per il momento, semplicemente di vedere che c'è la partecipazione nel, eh, pri, per prima, nell'atto di grazia santificante eh, eh, c'è un'elevazione eh, soprannaturale nella vita trinitaria. Alla stessa volta però è una qualche partecipazione nel, nell'aspirazione passiva dello Spirito Santo, la missione dello Spirito Santo. Poi la, la virtù di carità soprannaturale segue dalla nostra prima grazia santificante. C'è un momento distinto, cioè la formazione religiosa di dieci anni, eh, non basta una conversione originale. Eh, la virtù di carità cresce, la virtù soprannaturale di carità cresce alla luce della grazia iniziale, e questa è una partecipazione nel, nella relazione di, di eh, spirazione passivo, dove lo, che è una riflessione della vita della Trinità imminente, dove lo Spirito Santo si rivolge in, in rovescio, in avvicenda verso il padre e il figlio, dalla quale lui ha, ha aspirato. Quindi, Adesso abbiamo quattro, due partecipazioni, ho descritto, nelle, nelle quattro rapporti della Trinità. La, la, una partecipazione dell'aspirazione eh, passiva, l'aspirazione eh, eh, attiva nel momento di grazia santificante, il, eh, una partecipazione creata nel... Eh, ispirazione attiva nella virtù di carità, poi c'è la luce della gloria, la capacità in noi eh, di, di avere la, eventualmente, eh, se non siamo qualcuno come Teresa di Avila, non, non so chi, ma una, una visione, cioè vivere in paradiso, ritornare a Dio è, 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 è che è una partecipazione nella visione del padre che ce l'ha il figlio. Una partecipazione sempre creata, però soprannaturale. Poi, eh, eh, finisco un po' così, ma uh, di, 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 di quella prima introduzione al, al four-point hypothesis. 
poi eh, eh, ci sono collaboratori, eh, Doran e, e Ormerod. Ormerod ha, ha spinto eh, eh, la, la cristologia, non meno, riflettendo sulla dinamica in Gesù stesso. E lui ha parlato che anche nella sua natura umana, che è anche in Gesù la, la natura umana è creata, una partecipazione creata eh, in Dio, eh, e che ci sono anche i, i quattro rapporti. La grazia esce, eh, continua nella vita di Gesù con la sua natura umana, unita ovviamente con la persona divina, eh, e lui ha, ha esplorato quella realtà in, in Gesù Cristo. Eh, forse lascio eh, la spiegazione un po' così, eh, spero che abbiamo capito, io non ho capito completamente, eh, no, tutta onestà, eh, ma ho questo senso dell'importanza del, del, di questa scoperta. Negli ultimi dieci anni Dorn ha cominciato a, a scrivere su questo, c'è una risposta in varie parti, si vede nelle, nei, nelle riviste, di, di, di giornali di, di uh, teologia, e um, quindi con l'aspetto cristologia abbiamo sentito a, a, alla fine eh, da, da professore Ormerod. Scusi che ho preso una bella parte della nostra ora. Eh, adesso ricordate le vostre domande. Non c'è una domanda stupida questa eh, notte, ma abbiamo coloro qui che sono competenti in questo campo. Quindi una mescolanza di diversi tipi di, di, eh, di questioni dopo saranno benvenuti, ben accolti. Eh, ma per prima eh, abbiamo due rispondatori. Eh, eh, quindi per prima chiedo adesso al eh, br professore Brian Lobo, gesuita, eh, esperto in, ha studiato l'Onergan, la Trinità e anche induismo, perché insegna nella facoltà di missiologia. Grazie a Brian per una risposta al discorso di professore Ormerod. Good evening, and um, thank you, Father Whelan, for calling me and um, allowing me to give my thoughts or reflections on this, this wonderful paper by uh, Neil Ormerod. I feel really privileged and honored to respond to this paper. Perhaps in the beginning I thought Father Whelan is making a mistake by calling me. I'm teaching Trinity and Mission in the Faculty of Missiology, although I did my doctorate in dogmatic theology. Uh, but later on, I thought probably there could be an aspect that I could offer and some comments that could help us go beyond uh, whatever the four-point hypothesis would like to offer us. In short, for those who would probably like to leave in between, the central idea of my response is precisely this, that if the title of the article has this to say, how the Trinitarian God acts in creation, Augustine, Aquinas, and Lonergan, uh, my question is, it remains within that historical point of time of the Incarnation. Could it embrace the whole of creation right from the beginning? So I shall be repeating that. I shall, I shall be reading my text. Then I shall make some comments on the four-point hypothesis of Lonergan. And finally, I shall try and juggle with a little bit some ideas with Hinduism and try to, you know, put them together in a very primitive way. The key to understanding the main thrust of this article, 
which is also its high point, lies in the question, what if we generalized Aquinas' structure by considering not processions, but relations conjoined with a created term? Well, the point here is that the moment you talk of relations, you've got to talk about that trinity that's relating to creation. So that's important. So we are not just uh, stuck up within the imminent trinity. We have to perhaps talk of the economic trinity, as Rana would say. But here, in the Lonergan way, we are wanting to talk about that relation, how God is having with creation, but obviously in the Christ event. So the previous presentations of Augustine and Aquinas in this article are only preludes to the four-point hypothesis of Lonergan, making Lonergan appear to be totally rooted in tradition and at the same time going beyond in his exceptional creativity. What Lonergan does not do is to develop his creative four-point hypothesis. So we see Neil showing us that passage where you see the four-point hypothesis, and that's it. Lonergan ends there. But by doing so, what is Lonergan doing? He leaves the future theologians to use it for further explorations. And one of the activities we see today in the last part of, uh, of Neil or Mirod's paper. So this article towards the end tries obviously to further explore one aspect of the hypothesis and that is Christology. It is this conclusion that left me with a sense of incompleteness. Because as I said in the beginning, I expected a more holistic conclusion after having read a title that went How the Trin Trinitarian God Acts in Creation, Augustine Aquinas and Lonergan. But isn't it true that God acts in creation through the incarnation and grace? Yes. But what about the time before the incarnation? But perhaps these issues would require more time and space and could not or cannot be tackled or, or probably could be tackled in some other lecture on Lonergan's four-point hypothesis in the future and could not be tackled perhaps today. If divine or Trinitarian action or participation in creation appears as the primary issue highlighted in the title of this article, then obviously uh, we want to begin from creation. It is true that it is only through the incarnation that we come to know the Trinity, the way we have come to know it. But precisely by this knowledge, we also arrive at a knowledge or conclusion by induction that the Trinity exists eternally and therefore before creation and thereby responsible for the creation of the world. So the article towards the end, using the four-point hypothesis of Lonergan, argues for a spirit Christology and that is one avenue that it explored with good effect. However, to be true to the title, it would have been better to explore the application of the four-point hypothesis to creation within the whole span of world history. But we must admit that the direct application of the hypothesis to creation could provoke theological problems, which I am neither planning to resolve in this short response of mine, or nor am I called to do so. So towards the end of this response, I would like to merely touch upon certain issues in this regard in a rather primitive, non-systematic way, perhaps to universalize the impact of the four-point hypothesis to the whole of creation. So to give it a, a, a universal push, so to speak. So before going ahead, I have two preoccupations with the four-point hypothesis in general, but which should not be considered as a denigration of the hypothesis. First, the four-point hypothesis appears to be locked up in the incarnation model of the second person of the Trinity. This perhaps cannot be avoided, but can the hypothesis go beyond using the incarnation model as a backdrop? 
Second, the four-point hypothesis appears enclosed within the paradigm of the psychological analogy and therefore once again remains locked up within the assertions of an analogia entis, that is the analogy of being, which was downright condemned by Karl Barth as a work of the devil and a methodology to be abandoned. This does not mean that we must slavishly obey Karl Barth and thereby abandon analogy altogether in our theologizing on the Trinity. We could very well support Barth in his affirmation that the knowledge of the triune God is only possible through divine revelation. However, by analogy, we are trying to understand the revelation in Jesus Christ. At the same time, we must bear in mind that any analogy cannot give us true knowledge of the reality. It points to, and most especially, the ineffable divine reality, because the original content of any analogy comes from elsewhere, as Rana would say, even though there may exist some remote connection between the two realities. For example, the tire is to the wheel as the shoe is to the foot. What knowledge or understanding of a tire would this analogy give to someone who has never seen a tire in his life? That's a problem of an analogy. So that's why Rana had problems. And then obviously Karl Barth would say, we better fall back or rather we follow an analogia fide. Okay. In any case, keeping in mind the four point hypothesis, I would like to ask, as I mentioned earlier, whether the conclusion of Lonergan of linking the four relations to the four created participations in the divine nature could come to play right from creation. Could the four supernatural realities, secondary act of existence, sanctifying grace, the habit of charity, and the light of glory, as we have seen even Father Whelan spoke about it, they could be present in creation, most especially in human beings who are created in the divine image and likeness, affirming thereby a reinstatement of the vestigia trinitatis in creation. This is a question. Now I'm entering into the mode of questions. This does not mean that creation as the secondary act of existence must be absolutely compared to the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity. But it could very well be the fleshing out of the divine in its finite absoluteness rather than the infinite absoluteness. So using a Ranerian term, it could very well be the supernatural existential present in human beings, notwithstanding the various interpretations, reflections, and controversies surrounding this term. So there, are, there is a lot written on the supernatural existential, but I'm just placing it here as one point for further reflection. So this path may have to be tread with great caution, but I guess Lonergan would not be against this exploration especially when he concludes question 26 of his The Triune God Systematics, where the four-point hypothesis is found with an important paragraph that God can produce finite beings similar to the four real relations and absolutely supernatural. And now I quote Lonergan to the full, sorry, I don't have a slide to show you that quote, but I'll read this as slow as possible. This is Lonergan. But if one says that God operates externally, not according to the relations, but according to the common nature, and therefore the real divine relations cannot be participated in this way, we must answer with a distinction. The objection would be true if God were a natural agent that could produce only something similar in nature as fire always produces heat, and water always causes moisture. But the divine nature common to the three is intellectual, and just as God, by the divine intellect, knows the four real relations, so also by the divine intellect, together with the divine will, 
God can produce beings that are finite yet similar to the four real relations and absolutely supernatural. Unquote, Lonergan. So to conclude, and then I shall perhaps uh, give some comments with regard to a dialogue with Hinduism. To conclude, therefore, Lonergan's four-point hypothesis has the power to divinize creation, supplying thereby an intellectual, rather a theological reasoning to the famous dictum of Saint Ignatius, the founder of his own society, of finding God in all things, because the world is charged with the grandeur of God. Hopkins. Now, just to connect it to this whole uh, creation symbol in Hinduism, we have many symbols um, of creation in Hinduism. Now, there's one symbol which talks about the world emanating from the spider in the Mundaka Upanishad 1, 117. So it's, it's like the web that is coming out of the spider. It's like the hair that's coming out from your head. It's like the trees and the grass that's coming out from the earth. So that way the world is coming from God. But the web is not the spider, so the, the world is not God. So you cannot have a very pantheistic idea because some of them say, well, this will lead to pantheism. Or if you want to see God totally in, in this world, then you cannot say that the world is God. So we know these problematic issues. But the point I'm trying to make here is that if you find this world coming from God in this way, as God is a cause of the world, the four-point hypothesis of Lonergan could be used right from the start. And with this start, I end my, my response. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Professor Lobo. Many questions there. I saw Professor Ormerod writing eagerly. Uh, but before we turn back to Professor Ormerod, another voice from Asia, this time from the Philippines, uh, a doctoral student, uh, the Father uh, J.V. Zuniga, uh, the, uh, who is using Lonergan Doran's notion of four-point hypothesis in a very practical study of the commitments of the Episcopal Conference of uh, Asia in areas like interreligious dialogue and option for the poor. So we see how this four-point hypothesis, which we heard so technically from Professor Ormerod, moves to pastoral consequences. Good evening. I am both humbled and honored to offer a response to Professor Armorod, who through his numerous and very clear writings has been an enlightening guide and solid reference in my study of Lonergan and Doran. I thank the good professor for his careful historical tracing of the building blocks of the four-point hypothesis that will surely impact my work. I am writing a thesis entitled Foundations for Ecclesial Mission in Asia, a dialogue between Robert Doran and recent magisterial teachings. And I have discovered that Lonergan's four-point hypothesis, as elaborated and developed by Doran, puts forward fundamental contributions not only for interreligious dialogue but also for social concern. These are two missionary priorities defined by the Federation of Asian Bishops Conferences, since Asia is 88% non-Christian and hosts literally hundreds of millions who live in extreme poverty and who suffer multiple deprivations. Firstly, through this synthetic theological construct that relates the processions, missions, and relations in the Trinity to created contingent external terms, sanctifying grace and the habit of charity are introduced as participations in or imitations of the eternal relations of active and passive spiration, respectively. Sanctifying grace, evoking the habit of charity in a person, imitates the father and son spirating the spirit in active spiration. And the habit of charity, as a response to the prompting of sanctifying grace, participates in the spirit, loving back the father and the son in passive spiration. 
Thus, those who are so graced with God's love and who respond to such love with a charitable life are especially related to the Father, Son, and Spirit. They can be said to participate in the Trinitarian life implicated in the spiral of receiving love and loving in return. Since grace is offered to all, and the loving response to God and neighbor can be observed even outside the confines of the church, then even non-Christians whose lives are marked with faith, hope, and charity can be said to participate in the life of God. When this dynamic of the life of grace is existentially self-appropriated through interiorly and religiously differentiated consciousness, a theological anthropolo anthropological ground for interreligious dialogue and collaboration comes to the fore. We decide to work for peaceful and harmonious relations with followers of other religions, not only because it is what the church teaches, but also because with the eyes of love, we experience, understand, and judge that God is indeed actively at work in their lives as well. Secondly, through the gift of sanctifying grace, that catalyzes conversion towards a more authentic human existence of thinking, valuing, and choosing, a person, Christian or not, can be a source of meanings and an agent of values that can influence and shape his social cultural milieu. Human participation in and imitation of divine life and love can therefore facilitate the implementation of the divine solution to the problem of evil through supernatural, supernatural charitable acts that promote progress and reverse decline. The healing grace of God coursed through free human subjects in and beyond the church can therefore tilt the dialectics of history towards integration and a closer approximation of the reign of God. Thus, should there be a critical mass of religiously converted subjects who think and act authentically and collectively in history, dominant culture may be reformed, which may redound to societal infrastructural changes that would pursue and serve the common good. The imperative of preferential option for the poor thus no longer only comes from external moral commands, but also from a stronger internal imperative and commitment of a life endeavoring to return God's love through love of neighbor. Therefore, through the use of the four-point hypothesis, with a focus on the created participations in active and passive inspiration and their impact on history, interreligious dialogue and collaboration for the redemption of history are given sure Trinitarian foundations with a more solid pneumatological emphasis. I greatly appreciate the Christological direction of Professor Armored Stock that underscores how the human Jesus fully and perfectly participated in the life of God, hinting at his uniqueness and universal salvific relevance for humankind. While the focus on the democratization of grace and the actual work of the Spirit outside the church is very important, it is crucial to remember that the outer avowal of love in Jesus of Nazareth completes, clarifies, and brings to fulfillment the inner gift of love that is the Holy Spirit. This not only prevents excessive interpretations of the four-point hypothesis towards relativism and syncretism, it also implies the great responsibility of the church that was uniquely graced to know him in the light of the Spirit, to proclaim him and witness to him with the same fullness of the habit of charity, especially with the religious other and towards the poor. If I could ask the good professor a couple of questions, firstly, it is said that the church is the icon of the Trinity. What could be the other implications of this Trinitarian vision to the life and mission of the church? And secondly, by affirming sanctifying grace and the habit of charity in the life of Jesus, you accounted for the workings of the Spirit in his life towards a spirit Christology. What about the workings of the Word in relation to that of the Spirit? Could you comment on the invisible mission of the word that comes with the invisible mission of the spirit in Thomas? And what could it mean for the theology of religions today? Thank you. Uh, thank you for those um, 
Two responses. Uh, I'll try and be quick in relation to responding so that we can go over to, to other questions that might arise. Um, Brian uh, questioned the relationship of uh, why this should focus on the second person of the Trinity or the Incarnation. Uh, and to me, it's, this is the parag paradigmatic example of uh, God acting in, the Trinitarian God acting in a Trinitarian fashion within the created order. So any other understanding that we might have in any other circumstance is going in some way to relate to this. Um, should we push this back to some sort of use of the hypothesis into, relation, into an understanding of creation simply as created? Um, I would have problems with that. Um, there is a, a move, it's very strong in Augustinian type theology such as radical orthodoxy to, uh, to try and supernaturalise the natural and I think it's really important to be able to maintain the distinction between the created order and the supernatural order. Um, so these are quite difficult and, um, uh, yes, controversial issues in some way. But where I would see an opening is in terms of sacramental theology, that our understanding of the efficacy of the sacraments <coughs> has to be tied in in some way with this sort of hypothesis. And you actually see it in Aquinas' discussion of um, uh, the presence of Jesus in the spirit, uh, the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, where after discussing transubstantiation, which is the stuff I suppose most of us might be familiar with, he then goes on and talks, well, how is this presence possible? And he actually uses the structure of contingent predication to do that. Now, that's not specified in terms of the persons, but it does open up the possibility of using this structure to enter into a discussion of sacramental theology, which I think would be quite, quite fruitful. Uh, fortunately, I'm not a Bartian, so I'm not going to worry too much about the Analogiantis. But I would say that uh, Bob Doran has worked to bring uh, a supernatural psychological analogy out of this four-point hypothesis work, uh, which uh, to some extent would respond to that sort of Bartian concern. Uh, it would not deny the possibility of a natural um, analogy, uh, and Lonergan's always been very strong on that, and so has Bob. Um, <coughs> I might leave it at that. Just to go to uh, some of... Uh, JV's uh, comments, um, uh, the church is an icon of the Trinity. This is a, obviously uh, what I might call a hot topic in theology. Um, and a lot of energy is being devoted to using sort of social Trinitarian models in trying to understand the church. Personally, I think these are theological dead ends. Uh, I don't think the social model of the Trinity works in any way, shape or form. Let me be very clear on that. But um, what you can do, and what I have done elsewhere, is um, uh, write about uh, the connection that I mentioned in the paper about the relationship between the four-point hypothesis and the life of grace and faith, hope and love, so the, the, um, uh, the theological virtues, so that we can actually start thinking of the church and the life of the church as grounded in grace and lived out in faith, hope and love. Uh, and that these have a specifically Trinitarian structure to them. Now that to me is a really significant advance because for one thing it brings the theological virtues out of the realm of being an interesting but perhaps not really well grounded uh, theological sort of um, uh, position and brings it fully into a Trinitarian account. Uh, and that's uh, a great way then of thinking about the life of the church in Trinitarian terms. Um, I think that's important. Uh, the invisible mission of the, of the word emerges in that same context because um, Aquinas talks about the invisible mission of the word um, as indwelling wisdom. Um, but uh, I think um, I remember the occasion at a conference where I uh, said to Bob Doran, 
you're not thinking enough about the invisible mission of the word. Uh, and the two of us together, I think, have developed the notion of the invisible mission of the word in us as faith. So, um, I mean, Paul is very clear that, um, uh, uh, you know, Christ lives in me, not I, but Christ living in me. There is a, an indwelling of the word uh, in the life of the Christian. Um, and one way of trying to understand that would be uh, a created participation in paternity, which is similar to the created participation that exists in us of um, active spiration. So that the, spirit, the, the word would dwell in us through the natural, supernatural virtue of faith. Um, so that would be one way of trying to respond to that. There goes the bell. So, thank you very much, Professor Ormerod. We have 15 minutes, and um, the... Uh, I already see a hand up. Uh, uh, okay, uh, we have a number of hands up. I see three hands. Uh, Felix, then Paul, then Cyril. Neil, thank you very much for the fine lecture and also uh, to the respondents. Thank you very much. Since I'm not um, in the habit of charity yet, uh, my formulation is a bit sharp. Um, but, I've, uh, but let me start in a very positive uh, way, saying um, this transition you observe together with Lonergan from a Trinitarian theology of procession to relation and relation understood as participation is very good, very helpful um, and enlightening also for me. But I think what you, plural, um, you and your um, com companions on that path of thinking, what you are doing is really um, making a transition from a theology of processions to a Trinitarian theology of reduction, not in a reductionist way, but Relation then means participation, then means light of glory, means therefore coming back into the Father. In that sense, reduction. And I think um, there's a lot of mileage in that uh, usage of the word light of glory in a more Ignatian way. When you come into the you know, Gregorian, you already, already see this building, this work is at maiorem dei gloriam, it's for the greater glory of God are not the Son of God and all those who are in the Son, children of God. Also enabled to give glory to God and thus recognize, acknowledge God and let Him, the Father, therefore be fully Father. Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name. John 17, high priestly prayer, I glorify you, Father, as you have glorified me. And then uh, the Spirit and the community glorifies the Son. So isn't there more than only participation? Isn't there this relation of mutual glorification and therefore acknowledging the other in the otherness? An idea. Maybe, if, can, would you mind if we take the three? Uh, uh, so, Paul next. Okay, Paul defer, or, you know, I thought he was pointing to the other speaker, but he was looking for the microphone. Okay. Um, well, thank you for a very interesting lecture. I've been familiar with your work when I did a, a master's thesis on the four-point hypothesis applied to a Trinitarian theology of a current mystical thinker. I just want to see if it worked. I came to the conclusion that there were certain other supernaturally created realities that couldn't just be overlooked. I don't disagree with you. I think our symbolism must be more like a seed growing and the plant coming out. And I think we're on this beginning with a compact understanding to, to differentiate out the various things. But there were clearly for me at least two supernaturally created realities other than the four that Lonergan mentioned that have been mentioned indirectly this evening. One is the church itself. The church is the, in one way, the ultimate 
supernaturally created reality because there is the mystical body of Christ and it's ontological, it's not a metaphor. Consequently, and also if I remember well, Doran, uh, when referring to the uh, four-point hypothesis, re re made a comparison with quantum field theory. It was to be unified field theory for systematic theology. And in a unified field theory, there was an understanding that you'd have a single force of which there were three or four different expressions. Consequently, I would suggest maybe the church as a supernatural created reality has the four different expressions which you've mentioned today. That would be the first point. Secondly, um, from Balthasar in his development of the Marian profile, um, has in a certain way an analogy with the four-point hypothesis. But again, it's the immaculate conception, which is also a supernaturally created reality, in a certain way is an expression of the, uh, the four mar uh, profiles of the, of the church. So I just want to suggest that maybe there's a relationship that is more than just, uh, as you put it, uh, the life of the church grounded in grace. I think it's the other way around. Grace is a consequence of the life of the church, which is the mystical body of Christ, which ties in. Any comments? I'd appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much. There's a lot to remember here. These are yeah. dense questions. Uh, our third man, a question, a question from the Orthodox Oriental tradition, perhaps. Hi. Uh, Good evening, my name is Cyril Pinchak, um, and it's not so much a, a, an explicit question, more I'm, I'm just looking for some possible areas of uh, further insight, because this has really been a fascinating talk, so thank you so much. I, I had a chance to study a little bit of your work previously in Toronto at Regis College, um, where I was before I came here. Now I'm studying at the uh, Orientale, I'm Eastern Catholic. Um, to that end, I, I guess I would say I'd also like to thank you for your uh, previous article. I think in 2001 you published about the psychological analogy that answered a lot of the anxieties around that, the psychological analogy. Um, the questions that I have are, are this. One is um, in this a dynamic of uh, the habit of charity and also the light of glory, I'm just wondering if you have anything that maybe you're aware of that would connect perhaps the, the light of glory talking about Christ, particularly the light of Mount Tabor, the light uh, during Christ's um, uh, theosis. Uh, and then, sorry, the second one would be like the, the habit of charity and the way that connects to an Eastern understanding of theosis, of humans in some ways which might connect to the first question, the question about how do, is there this sort of dynamic between uh, both humans and God sort of connecting and, and relating and, and interconnecting in some way. Um, and the other is uh, from Bulgakov. He talks about a kenosis, not just of the son, but also a kenosis of the father and of the spirit. And I'm wondering if that could offer some insight into this mutual sort of dynamic, uh, back and forth dynamic. So I, I'm sorry, it's not very clear in my questioning, but maybe there's something, uh, some insights that you could offer. Gosh, gosh, gosh. Um, look, uh, in relationship to, let's try and go through them in some sort of order, the, the glorification issue. I'm not quite sure that I understood um, the concern there, um, a lot of it is how do like how do we give glory to God, in a sense? Um, what is you know what is the way in which we give glory to God? Well, um, through love of God and through love of neighbour. Uh, so there already we've got this sort of active and passive spiration issue uh, involved there. Um, uh, the, uh, I'm not quite sure how I would relate that to the question of the light of glory. I didn't, uh, I didn't think there was anything in your question, as, in as much as I understood where it was going, that um, if I worked at it, I couldn't work these four-point four hypotheses into it. Um, but uh, So I'm, I might just leave it at that, and if you want to come back at me... Um, as to the question of whether there are other created participations of the divine nature, and in fact there are. Um, as I mentioned, uh, one avenue to open this up is sacramental theology. And I've actually written about this, that um, 
You know, the Eucharist is a created participation in the divine nature. Uh, and uh, Aquinas' discussion of the Eucharist clearly evokes this structure of a contingent predication. He says there's a change not in God but in the reality considered. Now that's exactly the language that he uses for contingent predication. So there are other forms of, and in fact, um, Lonigan, for example, doesn't consider faith as a created participation. Well, I think uh, certainly Bob and I have argued strongly that we could consider faith as a created participation in the divine nature. What the, what the structure is, it's a formal structure. Uh, we have a formal structure of created relations. The question, question is, um, uh, we have to ask if we're considering anything supernatural, per se, how can we as creatures relate to God in a way which is not simply the relation of creator to creature? Now, uh, here I think Rana has a, a genuine insight, something I don't say very often, but anyway, Rana has a genuine insight, that... Um, only a Trinitarian God can be a self-communicating God. That is, only, only a God who is internally differentiated, in which there are, in, with whom there are internal relations, can enter into a relationship with the creature, which is not simply a reproduction of the creator-creature relation. So anything that is supernatural must in some way relate to the internal differentiations, the Trinitarian differentiations. Now, um, then it becomes a question of fact. That is, can we identify a created participation in paternity? Can we identify a created participation in filiation? Uh, they are contingent realities and the, the, the created order could be quite different. Like there could not have been an incarnation or the Holy Spirit could have been incarnated or whatever. But in the, in the life of grace that we experience, what can we identify in terms of this internal relatedness to the Trinitarian persons? So um, the church, yes, is the body of Christ. So there is a created participation there, which I would say is through the life of grace. So sanctifying, classically cl sanctifying grace and lived out in faith, hope and charity. Initiated in the concrete life of Jesus, who is the model of that, in whom the fullness of divinity dwells. So that we, uh, as the body of Christ, live in a participation in what was in the fullness of Jesus. So I think, yes, there are. The, uh, the von Balthasar Marian profile I'm just not familiar with, so I can't really say. Um, in terms of that light of glory issue and uh, the theosis and transfiguration, this is again, um, I'd, I'd go back to that Rana comment that however we understand this divinisation, if it is to be a Trinitarian divinization, if it is to be not simply a reproduction of a creator-creature relation, then somehow it will involve the Trinitarian relations. Uh, and how that might work out is another issue. Um, uh, the kenosis thing, I'm not so sold on. I'm not, I'm not comfortable talking about the kenosis of the Father or the kenosis of the Spirit. Uh, I don't think there's any strong theological justification for that. This is a word, I think, which appears once in the New Testament. And people have built enormous theologies out of it, which I think are, are fairly fragile. Uh, and clearly the early church fathers, when they spoke about the kenosis of the Son, talk about, talked about it as the addition of the human nature to the divine nature. So they didn't... Uh, they didn't have 
you know, an emptying out of the divinity of the psalm or anything like that. They just said, well, the kenosis is the addition. Um, so um, I know that there's a lot of, again, people like Ron Balthasar and others who, who get very caught up in this idea of kenosis, but I really don't find it all that helpful myself. Now, let us be punctual, for once in my life at least. Uh, the, so I know there are more questions. We can see the, the, the fascinated attention uh, for, uh, for, from this side uh, of the audience. But I'd like to thank Professor Ormrod very especially. So can we just maybe give a round of applause? <laughs>